Hello, a very good morning to you. It is Wednesday, the 17th of September. Welcome along. Seventh. Seventh. <laughs> It's seven in the morning. Uh, yes, uh, and welcome along to Ireland. Four seconds, four seconds. We've made it without it. It's been four seconds since our last mistake. Now, from an iconic soap star to a savvy sculptor, we've got a busy show lined up between now and ten. There is a reason he's all excited. You'll find out in just a second. First up, the fear of winter blackouts has led to a 250% rise in people buying mm. home generators. At 7.15, we're going to discuss the energy crisis and the government plans to turn down the heat in public sector buildings. Now, if you're in the market for a newer second-hand motor, later on, we're going to be talking about car finance. Plus, soap legend Adam Woodia tells us whether his iconic character Ian Beale will make a return to EastEnders. Now, Alan, sitting over there pretty, shouting what date it is. How are you doing? What else can we expect on the show this morning, Alan Hughes? Well, I think this is what has um, Tommy in a tizzy. Mm, in a bit of a tizzy. Because we're, chatting, we're chatting about jizzy jewellery. <laughs> now, if you don't know what jizzy jewellery is, it's a one-of-a-kind piece crafted from Wait for this. Semen, <laughs> breast milk, <laughs> and other bodily fluids. <laughs> say no more. Do welcome, say more. You have welcome, to say more. Welcome to Ireland oh. AM of a, of a Wednesday. <laughs> welcome to Ireland AM of a Wednesday. What's Look the around. name again? Jizzy Jewelry. Wow. How does it even work? We're going to find, find out. out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have to tell you that now, Tommy. Uh, OK, uh, <laughs> let's go down to Derek. Derek, what's the weather looking like? Are we getting some rain today? Did I hear that right? You're some share of messers, guys. Anyway, Al, I absolutely got soaked to the bone yesterday. The rain went through my trousers, it went through my shoes. So today, uh, we're taking no chance. Got the rain gear here on standby because we're expecting more heavy rain out there today. An ongoing risk of spot flooding out there this Wednesday. But we've come down here, guys, to Rathfarnham in South County, Dublin, because we're off to meet our furry friends. We're going to head off to Marley Park because Pups in the Park is kicking off this weekend. We're going to be catching up with the dog father, amongst others. So think cute, think fluffy. Think Alan Hughes. <laughs> I was thinking more of you, Derek. There we go. Yeah. Lovely stuff. Cheers. We'll catch up with you later on. Now let's get the news with Anne O'Donnell. Thanks, Sammy. Good morning. The Cabinet will today sign off on plans to conserve power this winter. Ministers will approve plans which would see the lights on public buildings turned off at night time and concentrating central heating to limited areas. Similar measures will be requested from businesses, while households will be also asked to use appliances like washing machines outside of peak times to minimise the risk of blackouts. The UN Atomic Watchdog Agency has urged Russia and Ukraine to establish a nuclear safety and security protection zone around the Zaporizhia power plant amid mounting fears in the area that it could it trigger a catastrophe. Well, the IAEA has said shelling around Europe's largest nuclear power plant should stop immediately. And the UN's Secondary Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has echoed those calls. I remain gravely concerned about the situation in and around the Zaporizhia plant, including reports of recent shelling. Let's tell it like it is. Any damage, whether intentional or not, to Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia or to any other nuclear facility in Ukraine could spell catastrophe, not only for the immediate vicinity, but for the region and beyond. All steps must be taken to avoid such a scenario. Well, back home, Garthi and Kildare have released three men that were arrested as part of the ongoing investigation into a deadly assault in Monaster Evan last month. A man in his 20s died following an altercation on Dublin Street in Monaster Evan in the early hours of Sunday, the 21st of August. Another man, aged in his 50s, was hospitalised with his injuries. Kevin Garthi investigating a fatal hit and run last month have arrested a man and located the vehicle suspected of being involved in the collision. A man in his late 30s is being questioned over the incident which occurred on the N3 at Bally James Duff on the 18th of August. To Pakistan now, where the struggle continues to control flooding in several parts of the country. More than 1,300 people have died due to the floods. Over 12,000 people have been injured and millions more have been forced to flee from their homes. 
At a roadside in the Sindh province of Pakistan, families are seeking shelter. Catastrophic flooding caused by monsoon rains has displaced millions across the country. And while the floods have touched much of Pakistan, this area in the southeast has been the most affected. But those forced to flee their homes have bemoaned a lack of aid. Over the weekend, residents were ordered to evacuate before engineers cut into an embankment at Lake Mancha to release rising flood water. The water from the lake flooded nearby villages, forcing hundreds of families to leave their homes in a hurry. When the water breached the lake, we got scared and left our village and belongings. We took our children and ran and came here. We arrived at two in the morning and it's been three days and nobody has come to help us. Last week, the United States announced $30 million in aid for flood victims. According to estimates, the devastation has caused $10 million in damage. Floods have affected more than 3.3 million of Pakistan's population of 220 million. Women and children make up the majority of those who have died, with the death toll expected to rise. Helen Gleason, Virgin Media News. And finally for now, a Brazilian fisherman is back with his family after floating in a freezer for 11 days in the Atlantic Ocean. Romualdo Macedo Rodriguez was on a fishing trip when his boat started to sink, he climbed into an empty freezer and managed to survive without food or water until he was rescued by a passing boat around 250 miles off the coast. He's described his rescue as a miracle. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Well, Anne-Marie, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. A very good morning to you at home and online. Uh, we're coming to you live here from Rathfarnham in South County Dublin this morning. We've got a real treat for any dog lovers out there now this Wednesday because we're off to Marley Park to meet pups in the park. So we've lots of your four-legged uh, friends on the way, including uh, the dog father, uh, Rob Walsh. Uh, so that's all to come into the next hour. Anyway, an opening look at weather together now with Mark Armstrong with us on cameras as we hit the hump of the weekend. Remember... All that rain we had yesterday, well, we have more of it out there today. Plenty of heavy showers now hitting parts of Munster to the southeast and into Ulster. Leash and Offaly through Strad Valley there into the Midlands, not escaping either. So this is the kind of gear you need to get on if you're heading out and about in those moderate to fresh easterly winds. Now, right across today, a very similar story to what we saw yesterday. Again, that system tracking northwards across the country, bringing with it some heavy spills, that ongoing risk of spot flooding with some thunderstorm activity embedded there for good measure as well. Top values of about 16 to 20. And finally then tonight, more shares ruling the roost and again leaning on the heavier side through parts of the south. Another sherry one into tomorrow morning. So no let up in the wet weather at the moment. But overnight lows back to 12 to 15 degrees. So that's how it's shaping up here in our farm at the moment. We'll catch you back live at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. Its headline, new British PM Liz Truss makes sweeping changes to government. Within hours of arriving in number 10 Downing Street, Miss Truss changed the entire top tier of cabinet, sacking supporters of her defeated rival Rishi Sunak and clearing out some of Boris Johnson's key lieutenants. Mirror's headline is Are Angels Together Forever? It reports that murdered siblings Lisa Cash and twins Chelsea and Christy Cawley will be laid to rest on Friday. The Sun's front page, let's not think of how they died, just how they lived. Those are the words of Father Bill O'Shaughnessy following the tragic deaths of the siblings in Tala. In other news, the examiner's headline, Public Buildings Not Energy Efficient. It's been revealed that thousands of publicly owned buildings are scoring as low as F and G energy efficiency rates uh, and do not have energy ratings at all. New push to get every home to cut energy use for winter. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. It states that every household in the country will be expected to curb their energy use this winter as the government prepares a plan to avoid blackouts. Also pictured on that front page are the Irish women's football team as they celebrated their 1-0 victory over Slovakia, bringing them one step closer to World Cup qualification. Amazing. Brilliant. Worse than even the 70s of the top story on the Daily Mail, the Taoiseach has insisted that every citizen 
will have to cut their energy use this winter as price levels have surpassed those seen in the 70s. And finally, the Herald also leads with the energy crisis. Keep cold and carry on is what it says. We were chatting about this in here and talking about, you know, switching off everything at the mains, plugging things out, because overnight it costs a euro to run the TV on standby. Things like your microwave, if you have... But stuff, stuff that all our parents did. Oh yeah, they? well that's what we used to do. Turn yeah. off the immersion, chase around the house if you left that Lights, on. Lights, close the door, Big plug time. everything out. So we're just I find wondering. I'm that nag at home now, actually. Is that Dads, who, is, yeah. you're looking at everything? Just wondering, is it something that you have properly started thinking about? Oh eight nine six triple one triple one, because fears of winter power cuts have led to a surge in people buying home generators with the heating. Uh, it's set to drop in public sector buildings in a bid to cut consumption. We're going to discuss all that and the, about the energy crisis after the break. Welcome back. Now, the worsening energy crisis is already hitting everyone's pockets very hard. Yeah, we're joined by Aaron Lynch from Irish Garage Equipment and Professor Aoife Foley from Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, Aoife, listen, we'll go to you first of all. Is this just media scaremongering a lot or could we potentially see blackouts this winter? Um, in terms of electricity, no, I don't feel it's media scaremongering. Um, you know, if we have a sort of an extreme cold snap, maybe two weeks of cold weather, um, and we, we actually have a capacity issue, we're short about 260 megawatts of generation during the winter months, yes, with, with a prolonged cold snap, we may end up having um, electric, electricity outages. As regards to gas, we're in a bit of a stronger position there because obviously most of our gas comes from the UK. 30% of it is indigenous from Carib. We There may be some gas rationing. Worst case scenario, that's the doomsday scenario. Um, and we, you know, obviously, as we get a lot of our gas from the UK, and if they're going to be rationing there, we'd have to follow suit. See, this is when so, you when you hear rationing, you know, you do obviously think of World War II. You uh, think of the 70s sort of a situation. And I suppose for kilowatts, I get lost in that. I'm not quite sure. I can't quantify that. But we and, do and have... And we use some blackouts. You know, we get the odd blackout. But how serious a blackout could we see? Um, you know, you might have parts of Dublin out. Um, you might have parts of urban areas out. Okay. Um, if there's an issue then with um, congestion or, or constraints on the electrical grid, you might have rural parts out. Now, people living in the countryside are used to this because they'd have more outages than ourselves. Yeah. But in urban areas, the dubs might have to suffer and they're not used to having <laughs> outages, really, to I be just, quite honest. Just say, there's a Cork woman there and she's like, dubs, we're coming for you. 0896 111 for people who are in rural areas that might be used to this. But Aoife, when you say rationing, do you mean that we could be going to the public, right, this is going to be turned off, you, your gas is not going to be there for four hours today. Well, um, I, like, I couldn't put a time in it now, Mirren, but if we have low gas flows, and if it occurs during an extreme cold period, when there's very low wind in the grid, and the UK has issues, then those issues will be passed along to us. I presume the government will prioritise um, consumers and typically what tends to happen is the consumer, the public, general public, are the last to be cut off. So the first loads to be hit and the first demands to be hit would be in large industrial consumers that don't have a process that takes a few hours or a few days to shut down. So processes and manufacturing facilities, our industry, our you know, public utility buildings, public government buildings that can really shut down their load they would be the first to be hit. I would be, I suspect after that then, the, the worst case scenario would be the ordinary public okay. because we don't want people getting cold or getting sick in their homes. Mm. Yeah, okay, so at least there is definitely, sounds like there is a plan around this. Aaron, oh, they have a plan. Uh, you work for Irish Garage Equipment, so basically you sell backup generators. You've oh, seen yeah. a 250% rise yeah, in definitely. interest around these. Yeah. Tell us, like, who is buying these and, and what benefits are they getting? Uh, generally, we get a lot of kind of domestic use. So people, rural Ireland is definitely our biggest customer. Um, we'd have generators from anywhere from 300 euro up to 7,000 euro that people would be willing to spend. Um, it would be a thing that you can connect to your house. So you can have your generator outside the house and run it into the mains of the house, which then when your power goes down, the generator will automatically kick in 
to supply the power back to the house. So you had people in rural Ireland that were yeah. customers, because I yeah. suppose we live in this world where, you know, you're in an urban centre and you just don't think about this yeah. thing, and rural Ireland have had to deal with this for a very long time. Definitely. But with this jump, yeah. uh, you're seeing other people going, I need a generator just in case of... Yeah. Like, I think you had one customer who's thinking about a ventilator, making sure a ventilator yeah. can run yeah. this this winter. Yeah, I've had several people in that situation where they might have someone at home with medical conditions. So they're kind of dependent on power. So without that power, they can't run certain machines that they need. So we did have quite a few people that would buy for that reason, yeah. So <clears throat> how much would one of these generators cost? Say a middle of the road one. Um, so the average one would be looking at around the 2,000 euro mark. That'd be for a diesel generator that would supply enough power to kind of back up the modern house nowadays. So you could plug that into the house yeah. and run that. And how much would that cost? to run on a daily basis? Um, so the fuel capacity, say, on your most popular one would be 15 litres. That can run 10 to 12 hours. So you're kind of looking at around 20 euro a day, which okay. is a lot it's, cheaper. It's not for it? meant for huge long-term use, obviously. It is if there's a blackout. Uh, yeah, for a blackout, yeah, still. But some people do generally use it as well also for reasons of saving money as money. well, because it's to cheaper. To bring the cost yeah. down. Yeah. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you, 896 111 because as Aaron said, Rural Ireland has been dealing with this for quite a long time. Um, Aoife, in relation to, we've got Germany, they're bringing in a raft of measures. Obviously, they have been uh, cutting, a, not cutting, but trying to make their public buildings, which the government are talking about now, more energy uh, efficient for a very long time. They're also bringing in windfall taxes on energy suppliers. What do you make of this move? Um, the, the German government, actually, if they do that, that will affect their wholesale electricity prices. So there, there's a balance. Plus, there's also contractual arrangements. So it's very, very difficult to implement something like that at, at very short notice in an energy market or in any market. But um, they're obviously prepared to carry the burden. But you must remember, in tandem with that, they're after introducing the energy ordinance, energy saving ordinance. They're also um, looking at the Energy Security Act and they're trying to reduce consumption by 10%. That's kind of the, the, the magic number, the bingo number. If we can reduce our peak demand by 10%, 10 to 15%, um, you know, the rationing is something that may not happen. Germany has massive gas reserves. They're at about 80% capacity at the moment. You know, aside from the energy savings ordinance, they're going to basically you know, 10 o'clock, after 10 o'clock, there'll be no public lighting on in buildings, public buildings and monuments. Some cities are going to go dark at night um, as a sort of a unity measure. Um, public advertising will go off at certain, you know, after certain times. Again, they're going to set their thermostats to 19 degrees. So I was suggesting 21 degrees, but I just want to put that in context, context for people. In the 80s, the average temperature of an Irish home was around maybe 12 to 14 degrees Celsius. Now people are setting their thermostats up at around maybe 23 degrees Celsius. So I was suggesting 21. I've on my fleece this morning, as you can see. So I'm advertising, you know, don't walk around in your T-shirt, put on your fleece or your little, you know, little thermal vest at home in your house or if you're going into the office. And if we can make all those energy savings like the Germans, then we can make a difference and maybe avoid having outages. Yeah, uh, and it's like, something we've discussed this morning, even this yeah, is but what is it used to be like. Is it a bit hard, Aoife, when you're kind of sitting there going that uh, when it comes to the national grid, that some companies are going to be taking two-fifths of our power to run, you know, in da data centres are taking two-fifths of our power. Is that kind of sticking in the craw? Like, they, are they going to be hit first before consumers? Well, they, they actually have their own... They'd, most of those data centres will, will have two sets of backup generation. They'll have diesel gensets, which Aaron has just spoke about, and he's probably very familiar with the diesel gensets a lot of those companies have. He sold them and to they them. Also have, <laughs> yeah, they also have backup batteries called UPS. So in actuality, they're prepared for this event because that's the nature of the business they, they're in. You must remember, Ireland has three large employers. We have ICT sector, which employs hundreds and thousands of people in Dublin, in Cork, in Limerick, in Galway, in Northern Ireland, where I work myself. Um, we're a pharmaceutical-based company, which is heavily dependent on, on energy as well. And we also have the agri-food sector. There were three sectors. And people need to pay their, their, their way, so they must go to work. So 
by us doing some energy savings measures at home and trying to avoid using the tumble dryer at six o'clock in the evening and using it maybe at half eight at night or half two in the afternoon if you're at home, if you if you if you work from home or if you're at home because you you, you don't work, then these are the things to do. Are even better. Get a clothes horse, stick it in your shed, stick it in your spare room and put your clothes on your clothes horse. Avoid using your tumble dryer. It's a very expensive domestic appliance to use. Yeah, no, it, it, it sounds, listen, it sounds really practical advice and even just, cutting 10% doesn't seem like something that's too much of an ask for people at home and we'd love to get the opinion for people at home. 0896 111 Is this something that you're already doing? Is there something... Are you kind of thinking, well, why do I have to do this? We'd love to hear yeah. from you as well. Uh, listen, Professor Aoife Foley, of course, Editor-in-Chief of Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews up in Queen's University as well. Thank you for joining us this morning. And Aaron Lynch, Manager of Irish Garage Equipment. Thanks Great for to having me. with us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Cheers. It's been uh, lovely to have you here. Still to come, uh, we're going to be chatting about car finance in just a little while. Uh, up next, we're going to discuss the other stories making the news after the break. From the heating being turned down to our biggest fears and phobias. Here to take us through today's newspapers is Michelle Hennessy from the Journal.ie. Good morning to you, Michelle. Good morning. Um, listen, I suppose we'll continue on from our previous chat. It's all about energy crisis. Um, but Eamon Ryan, so they're discussing turning public sector buildings the temperature down to 19 degrees. Yeah. 19 degrees, as we just heard from Aoife there, is quite low. A bit, it might be a bit of a shock to people. Yeah, and I mean, I think that for, for workers, they're really going to feel it, you know, in, in the winter when you go in, you might have all the, all the public sector workers wearing hats and scarves and gloves at their, at their desks. Uh -oh. I mean, I, I do think that, um, like some, something that experts have been saying to me is that the, the move towards hybrid working has been helpful here because if you do have an option of working from home, you're probably going to be more comfortable and you have more control over your heat at home. It might be the case that they... that they your own that, home. Well, you do, yeah. that's yeah. it. Th th then it costs you. But in public sector buildings, you have to remember as well that... Um, the, the energy ratings of those buildings is quite low. It's, it's F and G for a lot of the buildings. And we're yeah. talking about, you know, places like guard stations and departmental buildings. And the staff in those, I mean, you might be turning the heating down, but the cold is getting in you a imagine lot. Imagine the draft. You know? There's only through. one building yeah. in a, a public building that has an A rating. Yeah, yeah. And it's a revenue warehouse, I think, in Limerick. The yeah. rest are all just steep, just, it's just, Oh, like it's really Imagine yeah, the that's cost right. it would be to try and retrofit all of those. Well, we're telling Think the whole public the to retrofit. They haven't done anything. Yeah, I mean, it would, it would be so expensive. I mean, some of the other things that they're looking at doing is, you know, rooms that aren't being used. They're not, and that's what they're telling people to do at home as well. If you're not using a room, don't heat it. Turning off the lights at night in, in public buildings. I mean, that makes sense, actually, to just turn off the lights at, at night. Um, but when it comes to, to places like schools, I mean, hospitals, for example, we don't know the, the BUR ratings for the hospitals. Yeah. And a lot of those buildings are very old. Yeah. And, you know, if you've ever been in a public hospital in the winter, they, they can be quite cold. Yeah. Uh, schools as well, we know that that was something that comes up during COVID when everybody had to have the windows open for ventilation and the kids were freezing and weren't allowed to put their coats on because of the school <laughs> rules, which is, you know, uh, another bone of contention. That's something we might see now again happening this year in, in schools in the winter. It's been interesting with public offices that they're saying that they could close down certain floors and then people will be asked to <clears> huddle <throat> together and you're sitting there going, so you separate us all out because of COVID. Yeah. COVID is still happening and now we're just going to yeah, bring sure us all COVID back together. Could very well come back But again. it is, it's, yeah. it hasn't gone away. It is likely that we're going to see more COVID numbers. I think people have forgotten that it's a thing now. It's, like, it's likely we're going to see an increase in COVID numbers in the winter in, in the same ways we see with flu seasonally every year. So that's something that, that they're going to have to, to think about going into that because you're, you're right. If they're saying to people, you know, cuddle in everybody on this floor, yeah. uh, you know, how do you manage an outbreak then? There's uh, even been talk about turning the Christmas lights off. Don't Lads. do that. I'm not, but I'm not joking. Like it's Christmas, in the, Well, I suppose if you've got two from, Christmas trees... Two you Christmas don't need trees. to have the second one. There's yeah. a picture in the Indo today of Tony from Temple Glanton in uh, Limerick and he he's well known for putting up this ma massive display or whatever yeah. and it's like, well, he's like, I'm not turning off my Christmas lights. And but he raises money for charity. He does, he raises money for charity. And it's just all very sad I'd and depressing. I'd love to know people at home, even this far out, to be discussing Christmas, but would you be willing to sacrifice the Christmas tree lights this year? Well, th there is the option of LED lights, though, which are more energy efficient. Yeah, so, okay. So th there are switches that people can make that aren't, you know, cancel Christmas entirely. Yeah. But, you know, maybe only put them on for or a couple of hours in the evening or something. Or something. Yeah, you know, there are, and the thing is, there are choices people are going to have to make. And the thing is that when your energy bills start coming in, they're twice what they used to be. Yeah. You'll probably just forego the Christmas lights. 
Yeah. And this is the government are kind of reduce your use campaign. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how people feel about this. Do you feel like you're being patronised to or when it comes to government, they're the ones who have to lead by example. And is it too late? 89 6 one what do you what do you make of all this? Um, because we all have like the bills are coming in. And it's a shock every single and, time. And even in terms yeah, of the cost of living, pack, living package, there yeah. is talk that it could get to two billion. It, it could be as much as two billion. Now it's likely the Department of Finance and um, Public Expenditure and Reform are going to push back a bit because they don't want to spend too much money. Uh, but I think that if the government is asking people to, to kind of knuckle down and cut their own costs, they are going to have to give support to people, particularly the most vulnerable, because when the bills come in and you have people on pensions and people on social welfare who just can't afford to pay them, mm. you know, and then they're getting letters in the door, that's when it's going to get really serious in terms of pressure on the government. Mm. So you know the, the they're going to have to, to do supports as well as asking people to do something themselves. Yeah, um, that's something that uh, we're going to be discussing, I think, long into uh, into the winter. Um, we know that Liz Truss, she's moved into number 10 and we were expecting Conor Burns to be uh, this Northern Ireland secretary. And it turns out that it is hardline Brexiteer um, Chris Heaton-Harris is going to be the Northern Ireland secretary, which I don't think is very good news. Yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting that in her in her first address as Prime Minister, she didn't mention the Northern Ireland Protocol at all. Um, and it's something that she had spoken about quite a lot uh, in, in her campaign uh, and, and before that. So, you know, I think that it was it was noted, let's say, that that, that didn't happen. Now, she did, it, um, her her people afterwards said that herself and, and President Joe Biden um, had spoken about it on the phone and agreed, you know, that protecting peace in Northern Ireland was very important. But that was a private conversation. That wasn't something she said in her first public address. Um, so I, I think that will have been noted uh, across, you know, European leaders um, and, and our own as well. Uh, I think it's interesting that she surrounded herself with so many yes men, if we want to call them that, um, people who were, you know, very supportive of her. It's the first time I think that we have two women in in the, the two most powerful positions. And um, so, Trees Coffey uh, is is her um, deputy prime minister, um, and you know she was someone who threw her weight behind Liz Truss very early on. Um, we also have uh, people like Swella Braverman, um, who is home secretary now. She had initially run herself, um, but you know was was sort of yeah, cast, yeah, cast right. early, and, and then she decided to to, to put yeah. her support. She wants to leave the European so. Court of Human Rights, so it seems like everyone from her cabinet is like they all come from Mordor or something. We'll see how that all uh, <laughs> yeah, that's works out. It's out unbelievable. With the cost of living over there. Uh, yeah. Yes. Can we move on to something about fears and phobias of Irish people? And Tommy is not believing this first. I don't one believe at this at all. all. No chance. What's it? What's this? Well, tell us about the the top, the the most mm. common phobia in Ireland, the number one phobia. What is it? Yeah, so this is a study that was done, and they they given us the top five. <clears throat> so I'm going to look so I get this right. So it's trypophobia is is the name of the fear, and it's a fear of holes. What is it? Okay, now so holes? yeah, really. No, I, all right, I feel like I need to explain what that means now. So it's not. So if there was if, if, if I had it, which I don't, and there was one hole here on the floor that wouldn't cause it. It's, it, it, you know, things like sponges or there are these plants that have these very small holes very close together. And I know people, because this, there was actually a big discussion on the internet about five years ago, I think, where there were these pictures of these plants going around and it was, do you, does this freak you out? And about half the people in our office were freaked out by it. And I, I couldn't get it. What? It's very common. So this it's is surprisingly common. more common than, say, fears of spiders yes, or claustrophobia. It is. Fear of spiders uh, is the third. Fear of open spaces is second. I'm surprised about the of open, open space, space. Of open space is being so common. Yeah. Agrof a lot of that, is, a lot of that seems to have come, come from um, yeah. COVID that people are now afraid of being yeah. on the outside. Uh, open spaces, there are more people afraid of open spaces than there are people who are claustrophobic in Ireland, which I think is, is interesting. You're not afraid of teeny tiny holes? <laughs> you not afraid of teeny tiny holes? No, would you, what? Like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and a fear of heights was the fourth. Um, so, you know, there's some of the more common ones in there. I mean, obviously, there, there are people who are afraid of, of dogs and cats. Yeah. And, um, Do you know anybody at home who is, is afraid, of holes. afraid of holes or open spaces? Because I want to hear from you. Please do get in touch. 0896 It's just freaking them out. You know, I don't think a woman can be afraid of them, but you know, I can, you know, OK. Um, Michelle Hennessy from the journal. Thank you so thank much. You so thank you so much. Do you have a, a phobia? The heights, maybe. Heights? Yeah. No, claustrophobia. Don't like, you know, the tight, tight open spaces. faces. Yeah. Um, we'd love to hear from you today. If you're afraid of the little holes and sponges, he, just tell him so that there's one I'd person out there. 0896 111 I'm going to get little holy sponges for you now. Uh, <laughs> now, Alan, what else is uh, coming up next? Oh, look at you. Look at this. My fear is I'm, I'm afraid of Murren. <laughs> <laughs>
I look at her. <laughs> you're right. You're, you're right, Tim. <laughs> now, whether you're considering a new or a second-hand motor, we're guiding you through the car buying process. And if you want to buy one of these, we're going to be telling you all about it. That's coming up next. Thanks for staying with us. Now, if you're in the market for a new motor, we have a guide to car finance as well this morning. Yes, motoring editor with the Sunday Independent, Geraldine Herbert is here. Good morning to you, Geraldine. Listen, we have been discussing energy crisis and cost of living all morning, so you have to be mindful to this. But energy electric cars could be a good way forward for people, despite the kind of outlay. Yeah, so if you want to avoid the rising fuel prices, let's be honest, if you, I know electricity is going up, but it's still much, much cheaper. The running costs are an electric car. They're not cheap to buy. That's the thing that you have to look at the total cost of ownership and what you're going to get out of them on a weekly basis, how much it's going to cost you. So I think there are, you know, they're, they're, they're the kind of factors you have to consider. What have we got here? OK, this is the Nissan Aria. It's brand new into the country. So if you remember, Nissan have their expertise of the Nissan Leaf. That was the first mass-produced electric car. And also they started the crossover craze with the Nissan Qashqai. So this is a combination of both. It's a 100% all-electric crossover, the Nissan Aria. And where, how much is it? That's the big question. <laughs> OK, so the starting price is 48995 Now, for that, you get a 403-kilometre range, though, which will do most people, let's be honest. Or you can you can go step up to a bigger battery pack which will give you 532 kilometer range and that's an 87 kil kilowatt battery range and that will cost you 63,995 but to be honest like a 400 range is more than adequate for most you've people. driven this yeah i did yeah i, I just i'm kind of interested in whether to go electric or not on my next car I, there's a lot of cars in this sort of category though yeah. isn't it there's volkswagen id4 there's kias there's skodas yeah how does this nissan one rate compared to them kind of do you think well as i said it's really good and you get those expertise of nissan nissan really know what they're doing when it comes to electric cars and as i said they know what they're doing when the cost comes to crossovers but i mean it's a tight market it's huge competition i'd yeah. say if you're looking at the car go and test drive a few of them because they're all really good but they might have something that suits you better a bigger boot a longer range whatever but in that price bracket there's a huge number of electric cars what kind of grants do you get with this now when you're buying this if you're buying an electric car. OK, in terms of grants, the sticker price has those grants added in, so you're not going to go into a dealership oh, okay. and suddenly get a nice surprise that there's another $5,000 so off they've them. already taken the, the grants price off is reflected. the price. What you can get, though, is you can get a grant um, of €600 Euros towards... Um, a home charger. Now you can get that even if you don't have an electric car, which is that only came in recently. So if you're in a position where you think, you know, you might go electric and you're thinking about a charger, you can get that installed before you even look at a char you look at an electric car. So that's worth considering. You also get reduced tolls, there's reduced motor tax. So the biggest benefit though are actually the running costs. That's where you really do save. So in it's kind of the fuel. initial outlay, but then you'll be hoping yeah. to make that money back, particularly when you see the price of petrol and diesel, diesel yeah. in yeah. in stations at the moment. So if you're to fund this and you have to take a loan out for it. Mm -hmm. Is there a best way of doing it? I mean, which way would you see people to go? Because you've obviously higher purchase or you have yeah. personal loans as well. Yeah, I think what you have to decide is, do I want to own the car at the end of all of this, right? So if you're quite happy to just pay for the use of a car, and I would really advise people looking at that at the moment, because it's very hard to know about depreciation costs and looking into the future. So a PCP... And particularly with electric cars, because we don't really know what the long term is with them. I actually would worry more about the depreciation on a petrol and diesel okay, at this stage, because okay, I think the enough. closer we get to 2030, the less attractive they're going to be. Okay. But anyway, if you're unsure about all of that and you're worried about making that outlay and that investment, a PCP is a great idea, because essentially what you're paying for over a couple of years is the use of the car. So you're so, paying the couple of hundred quid a month just to use the car. It's never yeah. really going to be yours at the end. Now, it, it can be yours at the end, but then you have to pay a balloon payment. I always think PCP is not for doing that because nobody wants that balloon payment. You're better off, if, if you want to own the car, go get a bank loan or a credit union loan and spread the payments over a couple of years so you don't have any of those big payments at the end. You're paying a set amount every month to own the car. So it really depends which you want at the end. So do you want do you, to own it or do you want just the use of it? So you're saying then after those couple of years, you trade it in and you get another one and you continue that loan payment type yeah, thing? Yeah, basically with a PCP, you can walk away if you've met all the terms and conditions and that's fine. You can roll on to another PCP or you can actually buy it. As I said, I don't think buying it is a great idea. Remember as well, though, when you go to buy a, a car, a, a, well, buy a car and a PCP, the dealer will put a future value on that car. And if it turns out it's slightly valued more than at that point, they can give you that equity and you can use that towards a deposit on the next PCP. So PCPs are designed to roll over and to keep going on them. But it's entirely up to you as to which you want at the end of the contract or the end of the deal. We saw on the front of one of the newspapers yesterday mm -hmm. uh, a watchdog talking about how to cut the greenhouse emissions and they're talking about VRT hikes, congestion charges mm. in cities and then of course cheap electric vehicle loans. Mm. 
Do you think we'll see stuff like this when we're seeing the cost of living crisis, we're seeing everything like this? The need to probably put more infrastructure into this and try and save money. Yeah, I think in terms of ERT hikes, there's no doubt about it. With every budget, I think petrol and diesel cars are going to become that bit more expensive. Okay. The government have said they have the polluter pays policy, so they're going to make it mm. more expensive. As for EV loans, I don't really see that coming in because I think more and more people are going for the PCP, so they're not owning it. So it's a different setup completely. I think it's a bit early for congestion charges as well. But what I think the government really needs to do is roll out a better infrastructure and convince people that if they buy one of these, that they can set off in the morning and they're not going to be stranded. They're not, and you know, and there's a, a decent range in all of these cars but they still need the reassurance of seeing a point quite close to where they live or on their... yeah. yeah and, in, and <clears> in places like dublin they need to supply a better service before they can start putting congestion charges in yeah absolutely and i think what's going to happen i don't see congestion charges coming in but i think with the bus connects when that's rolled out with cycling infrastructure and everything it's just going to become so difficult to get a car in and out of dublin that in itself is going to discourage people to drive so i don't think we need congestion charges in that it's sense. very interesting that you're it's saying like that people are just um they're not Buying, they're not uh, doing, buying the car to own it. Yeah. They're literally just renting it, basically. But if you think basically. about it, we've moved towards that with Spotify, with Netflix, with all of these things. We don't own things anymore. You know, we pay for the use. So moving towards car usage is the same thing. And also remember, cars don't appreciate in value. They depreciate. So why would you want yeah. to own one? Hop in there, I'll see one. what you think. Uh, Geraldine <laughs> Herbert, of course, uh, motoring journalist for the Sunday Indio. Thank you so much. Al, thumbs up, oh, I reckon. Yeah. Very nice, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll see so you later. Suits him. crash into that wall. Uh, right, still to come, the soap legend who played Ian Beale for over 30 years. And we hear from a therapist who thinks we put too much emphasis on our emotions. Now, Tommy, no crying here. We'll see you after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to Ireland AM. Lots more still to come before 10 a.m. Now, swapping the square for the stage, Adam Woodyat on playing EastEnders Ian Beale for 35 years. Later on, we're going to hear from the therapist who thinks we put too much emphasis on our emotions these days. Just shut up. Get over it. Oh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, Jess. <laughs> uh, plus, the Canadian artist turning man juice into jizzy jewellery. Catherine <laughs> 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 Hayden isn't impressed. <laughs> Uh, are you impressed? Uh, yeah, so we're going to learn how to make some jizzy jewellery later on. You all right, Catherine? Can we, can we get you? Can we get you? full hours, she uh, said. What do you think? What's coming up in the kitchen? <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. Oh, my God. This is a typical Wednesday morning in Ireland AM. Welcome to Ireland AM. It's uh, calzone in the kitchen this morning. Is this the first time you've ever made calzone? Calzone, it's, calzone is Italian, obviously, as you know. And it's really just a filling enveloped in either pizza or an unusual pastry or topping that I'm using today. This is a very simple one. It can be either put in the oven or in the frying pan. And it's great to have ready for the children when they come home from school. I tell you, you, it, you wouldn't want your jewellery to fall it, into it. Oh, oh stop. Oh, now, come on. Stop. Ah, oh, stop, Tommy. Stop, I'm not Tommy, able. No, stop. <laughs> I'm not able. Mercy. <laughs> She's not able, for God's sake. <laughs> Time oh, to get to the big birthday, Catherine's big birthday. We'll tell you about that later. <laughs> it's time now to take a look at today's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, new British Prime Minister Liz Truss makes sweeping changes to government. Within hours of arriving in number 10 Downing Street, Miss Truss had reshuffled the entire top tier of cabinet with staunch Brexiteer Chris Heaton-Harris appointed as Northern Ireland Secretary. Mirror's headline is Our Angels Together Forever. The murdered siblings Lisa Cash and twins Chelsea and Christy Cawley will be led to rest on Friday. The Sun's front page reads, let's not think of how they died, just of how they lived. Those are the words of Father Bill O'Shaughnessy following the tragic deaths in Tala. In other news, the Examiner's headline, Public Buildings Not Energy Efficient. It's been revealed that thousands of publicly owned buildings are scoring as low as F and G on energy efficiency ratings, while some don't even have an energy rating at all. New push to get every home to cut energy use for winter. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Every household in the country will be expected to curb their energy use this winter as the government prepares a plan to avoid blackouts. Also pictured are the Irish women's football team as they celebrated their 1-0 victory over Slovakia, bringing them one step closer to World Cup qualification. Go on, you girls in green. Worse than ever, worse than the 70s is the top story in the Daily Mail. The Taoiseach has insisted that every citizen will have to cut their energy use this 
winter as price levels have surpassed those seen in the 70s. And finally, the Herald also leads with the energy crisis. Keep cold and carry on is what it says. That's great, kind of, isn't it? <laughs> keep cold and carry <laughs> on. We Cheers love that. that. Yeah. To be fair, it kind of follows on from one of some of the texts. Yeah. Yes. And Maureen says, I love this. Maureen says, I've become obsessed with turning off everything on standby. I cut the immersion time in half, only turn on lights that the rooms were in, and only turn the dishwasher and washing machine on when it's full for a full wash. Yep. Good so on you, Maureen. Upset, it's a pain, but it can be done. And I suppose we're all going to follow suit on and that no one. And no dryer and make sure you get out the, the clothes well, horse. Yeah. Well, well, listen, listen, do your bit. Yeah. Listen, I've been going out trying to turn like microwave and bits and pieces, like mm. st t turn off the switch. Um, we were talking about energy generators as well and how there's yeah. been a 250% rise in people wanting them. We've got a message in, not being funny, but if people can afford to run out and buy a generator, that's all well and good for them. As for the rest of it, who are going to be panicking about how we're going to manage. Some of the people that were buying those generators use ventilators in the house, yeah. and they're worried about the person on the ventilator not yeah. being able to breathe. So you can kind of understand, understand them finding that you the need money. To be on a and, saying, and, and get uh, on a priority GP list as well. surgeries, um, pharmacies, pharmacies, things like that mm. as well. And Anita does say, I've got a medical condition and my public health nurse advised me to log into my energy provider and apply to be put on the vulnerable priority, priority list. list. So this is the thing, that if you're using medical devices like me, so Anita's using them, your home Very will good. be last to cut off if you need that electric. So that is something that is, and that's people La need to get on and do that. Very last good. last Very good. to be cut off. Uh, now, phobias. Yeah, something Tommy. completely different. Tom Tommy has just this is... can't believe that people have a phobia for holes. Holes, right. So the number one <laughs> phobia in Ireland is of holes. <laughs> holes, like what even it's is called... Holes in the ground, holes Tribal in the wall. Phobia. Number two. Phobia of uh, open space. Agrophobia. Well, no, agrophobia, I know, but, but like but the like holes in, in the field. Walls. Can we just hold on? I have a fear of holes, as you call it. Honeycombs freak me out amongst many other things. They absolutely make my skin crawl. Do we have a picture of what we're talking about? Because some people are like, what are you on about? Like a big man? No. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, the I'm terrified now. Look at that. Does, this, mean, does this, that make you... Right, put up a, can we get a picture of a look, spider? No, hold on a second. More scared are of you spider? afraid of that? No, you... no, but I'm just saying we probably should have said to people who are afraid of, who have trypophobia, sorry about that, but that's what we're... <laughs> oh, Avril is... Field. Our sound operator, Avril, is inside freaking out at looking at that right well, now. Well, that's one at... person. It can't be number one. And our director, Mo, wants to show it again so that Avril Surely. gets freaked so, out. That's mean. So number, that's three, mean. number three is fear of spiders. Number four is fear of heights. And number five is fear of small spaces. I thought those three would be the top three. Very surprised. And there's somebody here. I'm absolutely terrified of light bulbs. <laughs> is, it, is it when light bulbs, like, afraid that they might blow up? Because I that love could the be... messages. Keep them coming in. It's but... not that they're rational. They're just fears that No, but your fear have. of light bulbs. Light bulbs are everywhere. So does this person go around terrified all the time? Well, listen, it would suit them in the energy crisis. Oh, <laughs> oh no. I, I knew take it. them all out. 89 oh, <laughs> 111111. We would love to hear from you. This fella isn't afraid of anything, it would, it would appear. No, small, small, uh, small you're, spaces. You're claustrophobic. Yeah. I'm, I'm claustrophobic like as well. No, I don't like That's that. That's number one. Now, from the square to the stage, former EastEnders star Adam Wojad is going to be chatting to us. Now, Adam, what phobias have you got? Hard work. Hard work, <laughs> yeah. We all have that here as well. <laughs> Talk to you in a minute. Thanks for staying with us. Now you'll recognise our next guest from 35 years playing EastEnders in Beale. From the square to the stage, soap legend Adam Wojad uh, joins us now. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. Good. I'm kind of sitting here because I'm just... Like Ian Beale is in front of me. It's it's just a bit <laughs> it's just a bit mad when it comes to television. You have played one of the most iconic roles of all time. I, I've never seen it like that. I've just been going to work. How do you? But like the store, everything you've been yeah. involved in. You're a part of well, the cultural zeitgeist. For what? Like people. There's a few. There's a few memes. There is quite oh, a few memes. memes. We've come to the memes. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Oh, Hold on, God. can we show people the memes? Okay, we'll oh, show the memes. Like, I started yeah. this off badly. Yeah, you, I'm yeah. telling you. You, you mean, brought yeah. it in. Like, there was this really emotional scene about your daughter, and it's turned into this meme. Oh, God, that, that one. Yeah. Everyone forgets. It was about Lucy dying. Yeah. Right? And it's turned into... I, I get sent it on a daily... <laughs> there you go. I get sent it on a daily basis. So this is what it was in. <laughs> okay. So this is the actual part, and it was incredibly sad, and we're going to talk, like, because it's one of the biggest parts that you've ever played. And even Look, Phil... See, I, nearly, I nearly made Steve cry. Even I Steve know. is almost crying. Yeah. My dad yeah. nearly crying, yeah. And this turned into, and I mean, there's birthday cards about this, there's Christmas oh, cards about this. Do we have the picture? calendars. Of the meme that it's uh, turned into all the time. 
That's yep, you. That's the one. How many times is that sent to you? What, on a daily basis? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, a dozen. Are you serious? Yeah, just, oh, it's constant, because everybody thinks it's the first time I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, oh, you get a great laugh out of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you won't believe this. <laughs> I yeah, will. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. But look, I mean, as you're saying, the storylines over the years that you've had in EastEnders from the time you arrived. And I mean, I know when we've chatted to people in EastEnders, they go to the end of the script and see, did I get the ding, ding, ding? How many? No, I used, to do, I used to dodge those. Oh, did you? Well, no, because you'd have to sort of stand there for like four seconds going, <laughs> and not reacting and doing what you would do if it was real. Yeah. Um, and Laurie, who played Jane, her mum used to say, oh, they must really like you, because they always finish the scene on you. She went, no, that's because Adam just keeps disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> so you never liked the... Do, yeah, do, do. Hold on, you genuinely have to stand there. You used to have to stand there well, for that whole... One of the worst ones was uh, Pam St Clements, who played Pat, and she was literally following Ian round the square for 30 minutes, trying to catch up with him and telling him the news that Cindy's dead. When she finally catches up with me and she has to tell me Cindy's dead, We've then got to stand there for four seconds just looking at each other going... Ding, ding, right? ding, and ding, and ding. Wait, waiting for the drum beats. <laughs> Obviously, the drum beats don't get played yeah. in when we're filming it, but, <laughs> but we've got to wait for that long. And we couldn't, we couldn't manage to hold it without oh, laughing. Right, you're laughing. <laughs> yeah. I had never thought that you actually just have to stand... You because two... it is. It is the pause. It's like... Yeah. She's dead. Where was it? <laughs> Where was it? Yeah, in reality, you'd actually go, Oh, my God. What? Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd react, yeah. but you don't. you just stand there. you just stand there. What, like, what was it like being there with Pam St. Clement, Barbara Windsor? Like, the, the people that were on that soap? It was pretty iconic. They were icons, because yeah. I grew up watching, watching them. I mean, we all watched the Carry On films. We all, yeah. we all knew Babs. We all knew Wendy from Are You Being Served. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's... So the work and with us. June Brown. Oh, June Brown. Yeah. Oh, I June. mean, oh yeah, bless her. But what was it like? Like, was it fun? Was it the family atmosphere that we all wanted to be behind the scenes? W Wendy took me to buy my first bed. And <laughs> Wendy Richards. Richard. Wendy Richard, yeah. And when <laughs> we went to the shop, because I was, I was sleeping on the floor in the flat, and she said, "You can't sleep on the floor. You've got to have a mattress. You've got to have a bed." Took us to John Lewis to go and get it, and she was <laughs> she was filling out the form to get the credit, but I was going to pay her. And when it got to the bit of where she had to give her <laughs> give her age, she went, "I'll oh, forget it. I'll just pay cash." <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, so brilliant! And I mean, the scenes oh, you you're talking about Lucy there, and I mean, mm. that, I remember chatting to you about the secrecy around that and the whole thing about mm. who killed Lucy. It was one of those, like, J.R. moments yeah. from Dallas. But the, the, big, the biggest secret was actually um, my mum was coming back. Jill, Kathy oh, was alive. Yeah. That, was, yeah. that was the bigger secret. Yeah. That was huge. That yeah. was huge. That, that, was, that, was the, that was the gasp moment when I, I was on set when the camera crew suddenly found out so well, nobody, happened, nobody knew. knew. Nobody knew. Well, a couple of us did. Yeah, yeah. you must yeah. have known. A couple of us knew what was coming. Gillian Taylor comes back. You know, characters have gone and have come back. You know, Sharon has gone and come back a few times. You know, is Ian coming I, back? I, I, I wondered how long it'd take you to get round to that question. Because we have to ask that question. People will always wonder, will he come back? I haven't got an answer. It's, look, the door's open, but... There's a lot of other doors open. Yeah. Yeah. And the door that I've got, oh, what a great way to get into. It, and it, the door I've gone through at the moment <laughs> takes me to the board, gosh. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready yet because when, when. <laughs> She's not happy with that answer. Like, this is yeah, my... I know, yeah, but I've only got a few more this minutes. Is, and I've got to go next one. Huh? But like when Ian left, you know, he was gone back into this kind of a bad character role. And mm. a lot of, like, a lot of soaps, they can be, you know, it's, it can be real misery, but there's always that lightness mm. as well. Just sometimes does it feel like we need to bring a bit of the lightness back that it can be too miserable? Um, I don't know because I didn't watch it before and I haven't watched it subsequently. OK. So I haven't watched it since. Although saying that, I did watch the, um, the Mitchell episode on Monday when they did the, f the flashback to 79. Oh, I yes. missed it. Did they oh, do it on Monday? That was on Monday. That was, uh, that's the first time I've watched EastEnders probably oh. since a recording of the live episode. The characters looked really, right. really... All I will say is that like them. The, the lad who was playing um, Phil Mitchell, oh, my God. He got Steve's mannerisms. Oh, I missed on. it. I Absolutely really wanted to see that. On. He was the bulb off him. It was unbelievable. Oh, yeah, it was brilliant. Really no, he, was, he was good. But when you did leave, then you went into I'm a Celeb. How was that? That was fun. Was it? it? I, it it's one of those jobs that I would, if anybody I know gets offered it, I would just say, just do it. Do it. Were you just raging it was in it. a castle in Wales and not like they're going to South Africa now? This I'm half Welsh. <laughs> okay. I just went home. <laughs> <laughs> would you honestly say, do that show to anyone? 
Not yeah. do a bit of Strictly. It's easy. Oh, God, no, no, no. Not the dance, not the dancing one, no. Not the, no. Not the dancing this one. This one, it's two weeks, you're done. Yeah. OK, oh, yeah. right, OK, so you enjoyed it? Oh, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And since then, let's go in. You're here for a reason, of course. Funny you should mention it. I know, I know. You have you're, to get it in. You're singing. Yes. Um, first, time I've, first time I'm doing that for 42 years. Wow. No, so like... you're playing the father in yeah, My Fair Lady. Although saying that during rehearsals, I have played Eliza as well. Oh, right. um, <laughs> Good to be able to do that. Yeah, it was, I was a shock. You're not no like this is a big West End stage version yeah. coming to the board. Gosh. Yeah. I didn't like having that voice in you. Did you know it was there, ready to go? Um, it, it's a little bit rusty. Okay. Um, and, but we've 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 dragged it out. I think we just just saw um, Stephen, who's been doing it in the West End. He. It's the two big numbers Alfred Doolittle's got. He's got a um, little bit of luck and get me to the church on time. Yeah. So I, I it's, get it's, married in the morning. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> this is what I mean. Everyone knows the songs from My Fair Lady. Because yeah. at first you think, oh, I don't know any of them. You do. And then you all of a sudden really you go, do. wouldn't it be lovely? Rain in Spain. I yeah, saw this years ago in the West End and I loved it. Was it Dennis Waterman? No, it was Martine McCutcheon Yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was, that was Dennis, Dennis Waterman, Waterman yeah. yeah, and Martine McCutcheon yeah, was alive. That. Yeah, so another East Ender. Yep. Right, was, since then, that was the last time it was on in London and for the last time it was on tour was 2005. Wow. So it's, it's not a show that goes out often. And the reason it doesn't go out very often is the cast is so... It's huge, it's huge. and it's expensive to And we've got on. a massive yeah. orchestra. Is oh, there a 30-piece or orchestra involved in this? Um, I don't know exactly it's, how many... But it's, it's, I've it's got the figures. It's 30-piece. Is it a 30-piece orchestra? Huge orchestra yeah. that's going to be at the board. Gosh, so travelling with all those people yep. and kind of getting... Because they've, they've been running in the West End. Yeah. Like, you've met the you've met the cast. or Like, how are you getting on? They're like, oh, God, a new fella coming in for Dublin. Um... It's, it's main, most of the main characters have, have switched. Yeah. Um, okay. Charlotte, who's going to be playing Eliza, she was the understudy in London, and she's been sort of like yeah. bumped up to playing Eliza, and she's 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 amazing. Her voice is just like an angel. I mean, she is brilliant. And, oh, everyone's got them so well. They've been so welcoming because if they haven't looked at um, sort of like me, Michael, John, and Leslie, it's like oh yeah, these people have taking these other people's jobs, it's just a... Yeah, you're it, coming in yeah. to do, you're, you're taking in. over the yeah. tour. It is an amazing show. It's fantastic. Have you, have, you, have you seen the London one? I've seen, Well, not this one, but the last right. one, but I was just blown away by it. The sets we've got this time, they're even... Bigger? Even bigger. I mean, we've got a re huge revolving stage for Henry Higgins' house, which the, the first time I saw it in London, I was like, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just the costumes, everything. It's just on it's such a It's one of these scale. big shows that yeah. you just go and you go, wow. Yeah. That's 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 what I love about it. Yeah. Henry Higgins it House. Do you know what? Can we all move in? Because property <laughs> prices the way they are. Uh, so uh, this is My Fair Lady. You, you wouldn't want to live with Henry Higgins. Maybe not. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. uh, with My Fair Lady, it opens on the 6th of October and it's going to be running until the 30th of October. Uh, it's on the board. It's in Board Gosh Energy Theatre, of course, and tickets are available on their website. Yeah. Adam, it has been a pleasure meeting yes. you. Have fun talking about Ian Beale all day and eating stuff in oh, the jungle. Yes, yes, I've, I've, got a, I've got a day of... Got a, everyone's going to be sick of hearing about well, it. Well, thank you that you joined us first. Uh, that, my you, pleasure, you, Alan. You were here first. Yeah, <laughs> and I tipped you off last week, didn't I? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Adam, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today. Right. Thanks thank so you. much. And uh, still to come, Calzone in the kitchen. Do you want to take one with you? You can no, take one with you. I might think you're coffee. might take my coffee, though. <laughs> uh, Derek will be meeting some furry friends. Now She's let's... She's it here. Now know, let's get the news. Here, right? <laughs> I mean, you're very far away. Huh? Doing, your, doing your notes there. Yes, what are you doing? For what oh, yeah. what Come item's on. coming up now you're doing your notes for? Welcome back to the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to Italian with Calzone. Good morning, Catherine Calzone. Lane. Calzone, good morning, good morning. all. This I is different for you, Catherine. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. Um, a, little bit, a little bit different. So what is and the it's calzone? it's great to be back. I've been missing for weeks on end. So it's and great. happy birthday. It was oh, Catherine's thank you birthday. Very much. Where? Oh, yeah. Catherine, tell us. I Last don't... week. Oh, was it? Yeah. Happy Big. birthday to you. Did you, yeah. have a, did you have a calzone to celebrate? No, my family. Are you going to tell us your age? No, don't. No. Well, no, go on. No. Do you want to? I tell was. Us? I was 70. Yay! <laughs> Happy birthday, <laughs> Catherine! Oh, wow! Oh. As I say, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have taken more care of myself. But anyway. <laughs> less of the anyway. pastries. There we go. A less the, of everything. Yeah, I know. Look, congratulations. Thank That's you very a big much. One. Very Thank good. you. It was, very it was good. a big one, all right. I'm, uh, I'm sure you're talking about the family. Um, I'm, if you haven't got a, a dough hook, you, you can do it by hand in a, in a bowl. 
but it takes a bit longer. If you have the dough hook, 250 grams, that's eight ounces, of our plain flour. To that, I'm going to add a half tablespoonful of baking powder. So a fair bit of baking powder goes into it, right? And a half tablespoonful is the same as a half teaspoonful. Teaspoonful is the same amount above the rim of the spoon as beneath it. And half is when you just put Did it... Did you top. get that now, Tommy? Did you get that, Tommy? <laughs> Half is when you put half that in. Right. What are you laughing at? No, it was just like the way you were saying it. I was like going, what? Yeah. <laughs> Go to say that again. Say that again. Half a teaspoon. A teaspoonful or a tablespoonful right. is the same amount above the rim of the spoon as beneath it. That's a tablespoon. Oh, right, OK. Or a teaspoon. If you want half a well, teaspoon... Well, I'm glad we've cleared that up anyway. That's you stop, <laughs> Tommy, Tommy Bo, what are you like? Now, <laughs> into that we're going to add... 40 ml, that's about two tablespoonfuls of um, olive oil. You just tip all the ingredients into the mixing bowl. And is this just a pizza base? You're like making? a pizza base, yeah. yeah. Yeah, OK. But instead of doing it as a pizza... Yeah, you're going to fold it. it over. Yeah, fold it over. That's what a calzone actually yeah. is. Yeah. In there, 120 ml of water, <clears throat> pinch of salt, and Bob's your uncle. I didn't know what the baking soda <laughs> that goes into... Uh... Into like a pizza base. I th well, usually no pizza yeast? Both yeast goes in for a regular, for a traditional pizza base. Yes. Oh, okay. But okay. Fair enough. We're not keen on yeast in this country at all. I find. You know. Yeah. It's we, hard don't, to get. we don't. We don't put it no, in. No, we don't. We don't do yeast like the UK. You know. Right. Um, yeah. Do lots with yeast. We don't in this country. So we were trying so, to do pizza bases over lockdown a lot. Yeah. And, and, and to manage. try and get the little sachets of yeah. yeast was hard to get. Hard to get the fast acting mm, yeast exactly. Yeah. Now you just bring that until mix that until the dough comes together. And that's ready for use. Now, if you're doing it by hand, you put your hand in, put the spoon in, bring it together and mix it. Knead it all right, and OK. Now, here's one that we... Just to show you what it looks like, I'm not going to waste time rolling it because we've two rolls there already. There's the dough now, this is what it looks like. And by the way, if you're going to prepare this for children coming home from school, you can make the dough the night before, <clears throat> yeah, cover it, it put it in the fridge yeah. and have it ready, OK? Now, you roll it out then and... You can either fold it over and cut with a, a knife, or you can take a saucer or a small bowl just to shape it. Now, onto that, we're just putting some diced ham and some mozzarella cheese. OK, yum. But you can put any filling of your choice in. You know, lots of different fillings, if you wish. Mm -hmm. There's water spilling on that on me. So ham and cheese. Ham and cheese. Very nice. And, and, and no tomato sauce. Wow. Do you know, like the, 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 well, the, the, the passata cheese or oh, something? No, passata, you know what I mean? like, yeah. You can put the you can, you can put, put, put whatever you want on it. Absolutely, tomato yeah. sauce, brown sauce, like Alan. You like the brown sauce? Uh, not necessarily in that. No, I'd like it. I don't know whether I'd like it in that. You're putting a bit of pesto. I like on a bit of pesto on it, and mm. I've pesto on the ones in the oven for oh, you too. Oh, gorgeous! So they'll melt. They'll melt, will they? Yes, they all melt. Oh, yeah, it all melts down. Now, just lightly brush with a little bit of cold water, and then you just seal with the fork. Very simple. Okay, right. Now you can make them in advance and put them in the oven to keep them warm. Or you can actually make them in the oven. There's 190, 375, gas mark four. Or you have them in the pan as well. I have them in the pan, yeah. You can do them in the pan or in the oven, OK? OK. So now so we just... they're quite simple then, isn't they're it? They're dead simple to make, look. Press it down with the fork. It's like a pasty. It is like, like a pasty, a pot, yeah. actually, now that you yeah. say it. It is, yep. <clears throat> now, down we go. Did you ever... I went to Cornwall once and the pasties oh, down there. Oh, you get them with a there. Oh, they're yeah. unbelievable. Amazing. Yeah, now, they are. Now, you just keep tossing them in the hot pan until they're golden brown. Okay. Or burned. <laughs> How old are you? Ah, How old are you? Ah, ah, behave yourself. <laughs> I you want can bring to him nowhere. Yeah, don't, don't <laughs> let him have one, Catherine. I'll eat it. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> no. Ah, look oh, at them. Oh, look now at these. Now, Alan Hughes. Bada bing. There we now. go. Love it. That a bit better. Look at them. So these are the ham and cheese ones. Ham and cheese, yep. Do you want a bit of sauce with yours? Well, there's pesto now in this one, by the yeah, way. Yeah, so I just want to see how much the cheese has melted in them. So it's, a, it's nice oh, and... Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love the double one. Right. Oh, we'll have a look. Did you cut it open? Mm. Look. There you go. Now, what okay. are you complaining about? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that. Try that. There you go. Thank you very much. I'll try this. Yum. How hot is it? No, not too hot. I turned down the oven. So basically, you just said you had your ham and cheese there, but you say you can put anything. Anything you want it. into it, yeah? Mm. Yummy. Dietitian, you can put. Di Diabetics and uh, vegetarians, you can put in whatever filling they want and any flavouring you want. Mustard, red tomato ketchup, brown sauce. Children love tomato ketchup, you can put tomato ketchup yeah. on it. 
So really, really simple, great for lunch. Perfect. Catherine, and happy, healthy. happy birthday. Thank you so again. much. Thank you. We love you. Amazing. And it's great happy to be birthday. back. And it's great, great to see you. It really great is great to, to see you. Now, after the break, we're going to check in with Derek with some four-legged friends at the Pet Festival, Pups in the Park. We'll see you in a few minutes. Very welcome back. Now, festival season hasn't quite finished yet with Pups in the Park taking place this weekend. Derek is live in Marley Park in Dublin with loads of, I hope, puppies. Hi, Derek. Oh, lads, we're caught in the lash and rain once again. That's two days in a row. Anyway, we're down here in Marley Park. We're having fun despite the rain. Uh, Suzanne, I remember Little Lego. We yes. met Little Lego a year you ago. You would have met Lego up at the DSPCA shelter. So he was a young buck back then. And very confident now. He's very confident. He's a bit cranky this morning. He hasn't had his coffee yet. So coffee. Yeah. Anyway, Pups in the Park kicking off this weekend. Yeah, we're very excited about Pups in the Park. So it takes place here in Marley Park this weekend. Um, so the DSPCA are delighted to be the chosen charity partner for the event. Lots of Fun things going on over the weekend for for dogs and their owners. Um, so lots of activities. We have the DSPCA dog show, so people can enter their dogs into the different categories, have a bit of fun with that. We have the DSPCA adoption parade, so we'll have dogs from the shelter who are looking for their forever home coming and getting a chance to meet people that are looking to adopt. And how's the situation down there at the moment? Yes, we're we're pretty busy. We're full. The shelter is full. We have lots of dogs, cats, we've horses, we've rabbits. Um, so all of them are looking for homes. So how many are you going to bring up here then at the weekend? We'll probably have about eight to ten eight. of the shelter dogs. So we'll have a little uh, parade and I believe you're doing uh, reunions as well. Yeah, we're going to have the DSPCA adopt a dog reunion. So people who have adopted a dog from the DSPCA, they have a chance to come and meet with us and staff and we get to reunite and see how they're all doing. and have All rescues. All rescue dogs. And you also have a little sniffari. <laughs> sniffari competition. Um, so people, they're sent games. So have a bit of fun with that. People can enter their dogs into that. We'll have prizes, lots of giveaways around that as well. So it's all about you know, including your dog in your family life, having a bit of fun with them. And well, I know along. it was a bit of a washout last year. <laughs> yeah, well, we had the, the first event from the park was in Malahide. Um, it was the weather wasn't too good, but look, we, we didn't care. We made the most of it um, and people came along and it's a brilliant weekend. It's, it, it's a great fun weekend with our, our four legged furry friends. And we're going to pop over here to a man they call online the dog father. Yeah. Rob, Wald. Rob, first up, how did you get the name? Um, well, I'm, I'm completely obsessed with the movie that The Godfather and dogs are my passion so uh, I just yeah, put the two together now tell us what you've got around your waist here yeah this is uh, this is what I wear for uh, the week's walking and um, it's an ab sailing harness and two rock climbing clips so you're obviously a dog minder by profession yeah, yeah. and tell and us trainer. how many dogs do you normally bring in a walk um, on average it'd kind of be anywhere from like six to ten but don't be at that but uh, but 16 is my record. 16? 16, yeah. So and, you have uh, them on the harness. This is yeah. a rock climbing harness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or abseiling even. Or so abseiling, okay. Hang off a cliff on this yeah, bad yeah. boy. So you bring about 16 dogs. Is that your record? Yeah, 16 is the record. So uh, I'm sure I can, can set a new one soon. And your involvement, of course, pops in the park this weekend. Rob. Yeah, so um, so I'll be holding a couple of kind of training uh, Q&As and uh, a couple of kind of fun demonstrations and stuff like that. Okay, so can we get them to sit very quickly? Yeah, Show yeah. us what you do. Barkley. So you're, you're literally just clicking. You're just Charlie. clicking your finger. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Charlie. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. This is the dog Ta-da! father in action. There we go. Just by clicking the finger. Yeah, off. yeah, yeah. Well, you can attach any verbal command. So you, you, first of all, you'll, you'll attach a, a visual command with your hands. Okay. And then just make a sound, whatever sound. You can be anything now. Like. Anything at oh, all. I know. Yes, uh, I know. Sorry, what breed is this dog actually? Barkley is a sheep a doodle. He's a sheep a doodle. Uh, yeah, so Barclay, a Barclay's sure. a bit of a celeb around on Leary. A bit of a celeb. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you're massive on Instagram. A yeah, big, yeah. A, a people, big hit yeah, on I think it's not me. I think it's the dog. It's the dog. Okay, well, it's a mixture. And Suzanne, lots of fun to be had this weekend as well where can people find out more online so if they go pups in the park.ie tickets can be booked on there um so yeah that's where to go there we go okay so there we have it despite the rain guys and it looks like it's going to rain this weekend we don't mind that because we're going to have lots of fun with all our furry friends down here i think we're going to let them loose and let them race around just <laughs> back to you guys in studio oh the rain oh, is coming down much, uh, they're wow. getting drenched. Poor, poor Derek oh, there i know the it's raining but that looks like heaven God, I want a dog so bad. Oh, I thought you meant you want to be in the rain. Oh. No. Well, well, you know, enjoy the rain. I wonder what the phobia for a dog, dog is. I'm going to get one as soon as I get a house that's... Dogophobia. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let it Finophobia. Have Finophobia. you heard of that? No. Is a phobia of dogs. Finophobia. Yeah, so you wouldn't want to be in Marley Park this My weekend if you've got finophobia. How 
Finophobia. Yes, but just doesn't want dog. a dog. He'll be getting a dog. Um, so that 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 fella, the dog father, I'd love to get him in to do a bit of training with yeah, dogs one day good. To, to see how he did. Sit, but just the, yeah. Sit. <laughs> hey, ah, man, ah, we've got sorry, our floor manager has just sat when we did this. <laughs> um, my grand, oh yeah, my granddaughter. Fear of phobias. My granddaughter has a fear of aubergines. Oh. <laughs> Is uh, who's that? Did we get a name with no. that? Where they're from? To see Margaret, I'm laugh. terrified of clowns. Now I do know people. Brian Dowling is terrified of clowns. Um, <laughs> terrified. Now, okay, here we go. We've got a text. So we're talking about the number one phobia in Ireland yes. is the fear of uh, holes. Trypophobia. Trypophobia. Now I have a very bad trypophobia and have had it as long as I can remember. It's a fear of naturally occurring uniform holes. So a sponge ne wouldn't necessarily freak me out, but if food our skin had a cluster of holes in it. It would be enough to bring me to tears. Why would your skin have a cluster Scientists of holes? Scientists and psychologists I, I, say I, it stems from a deep-rooted fear of disease. It sounds so strange to many, but so many things in everyday life can trigger me. There you go. Thank you for that. Thank you very but much. But is that really the number one in Ireland? Oh eight nine six triple Anybody one. Else? Triple one. We'd love to hear more from you. Still to come, we're talking feelings, fashion, and jewellery made from bodily fluids. Someone's got, someone's got a phobia of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, back after this short break. <laughs> Hello, you are very welcome back to the final hour of Wednesday's show. Coming up, we talk to the therapist who says we are too emotional. We're chatting too much about our feelings. We all just need to sh shut up. Love to know what you think about that. Later, the Canadian artist going viral for her custom creations being dubbed Jizzy Jewelry. And we're not seeing all of it in that clip anyway. It looks nice though, doesn't it? It does look very nice. Yeah, we'll explain all very shortly. Plus, with the wet weather, it's time to wrap up. Alan, what's on the catwalk? Oh, I tell you, we need our coats, Justine. We certainly need our coats this week. <laughs> yes. It's good timing. Yes, it's but good timing. we're not it's quite ready for there. the winter coat. Well, this morning maybe we are. So I'm kind of showing these transseasonal coats. So the oh, coat again. Transseasonal coat. Yes, the okay. coat again you're seeing on the catwalk, you know, we've got the blazer, the trench, the leather jacket. It's this kind of in-between weather before we're ready for the heavy, heavy winter. Coat. Okay, so it's still a bit warm out of nice to have something like this. Yes, the okay. kind of in-between, and maybe we can wear them again in spring. That looks lovely. That it's is really gorgeous, nice. And uh, Derek is wrapped up in the rain. For the, Is it going to be raining for the rest of the day, Derek? <laughs> oh, guess what, Al? The rain is going to come down for the rest of the day. But we don't mind that because we're surrounded by all our furry friends. Uh, Rob, can we get them to all sit again the way you did it last yeah, yeah, yeah. time? Guys, look, 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 watch this, sit. watch this. Just by clicking, look, Barkley. Look, just by Body. clicking his fingers. <laughs> oh no, they're not doing it this no, time. No, they're oh, they're distracted. <laughs> yeah, there you go, that's live TV, Rob. Sorry, sorry, we've ruined your reputation. The dog father out the window. <laughs> oh, the rain's coming down, lads. The rain's coming down. Oh, sit, Chucky, sit. 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 You're trying to get the sit. Sit, Ubu, sit. Sit. I'm already sitting, what can I say? You're very welcome back. Now, shall we talk about more uh, phobias? Yeah, there's so many of them coming in. I mean, like, do you have, you were, I'm the same claustrophobia. Claustrophobia. I'm very, I'm claustrophobia. And rats is something well, I Well, yeah, I really... think everybody has a fear of rats. That's well, okay. Anne says, it's unfair to laugh, uh, to laugh about a genuine phobia that a person has. Yeah, but also they are funny. I've got a fear of ducks. I expect people to laugh at me. Like, I run we're away from ducks. Like, we're, we're, we're not really about laughing. Such, we're but... laughing about, like... Well, the world is serious. Can we not laugh, laugh about people being I'm afraid of holes? At, like dogs. how a fear of holes is the number one fear in Ireland, as I thought. It does like, seem strange. Fear of spiders yeah. or claustrophobia or heights would be higher yeah. up than a fear of, of holes <laughs> and a fear of open spaces is well, number two. Well, agoraphobia is, is one. But I have a fear of balloons. Neve, I sort of understand this, um, in particular when they burst and you get that feeling that they might burst. I was at my nephew's third birthday party. Could you imagine? me trying to avoid the balloons all day. I was exhausted. <laughs> like, you know, get me out of this party. Oh, and nowadays, you know, when you go to something and they've got those balloon yeah. entranceways, yeah. nightmare for you. I was at a birthday party. Through. The, the fun that kids can have with the balloon. And Bursting them off oh, each yeah. other and all stuff right. as well. A fear of butterflies. Oh, wow, OK. What a yeah, nice. They're, you know, yeah. coming at you. Uh, I, I'm terrified of cigarettes. I can't bear to touch them. And if someone comes near me with one, I freak out. It comes from when I was a child and I asked an old man why his fingers were yellow. He said, from cigarettes. And that was it. 
There you go. Well, do you know what? Oh. Isn't that handy? That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, that's that is a good one. A good one. Um, what's it called when you have a fear of nothing? <laughs> I bet you there. I bet you there is a name. We will Google that. Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, I mean, oh. he's he said he's not. He doesn't really. Like I'm not mad on monster-sized spiders, just, but I wouldn't scream nobody, and run away. I used no. to catch bees in my hands as a youngster. So you've got a fear of nothing. We're going to Google that and find yeah, out yeah, if there, there is go. a name for you. Let us know. Keep texts coming in. We'll try and get through a few more later in the show if we can. But looking forward to this chat. Up next, the therapist who says our fixation on feelings is doing more damage than good. Who knows? We're going to chat about it after the break. <sighs> Welcome back to the show. Now, therapist and author Gillian Bridge believes today's society is over-emotional and too fixated on feelings. We'd love to hear what you think about this. 0896 111 And Gillian joins us now. Good morning, Gillian. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a new book that, um, that the title itself, I think, will people get. Sweet Distress, How Our Love Affair with Feelings Has Fueled the Current Mental Health Crisis. Can you tell us why you think this is true? I think it's true because we're getting into a, a phase of high octane emotionalism and excitability. Everyone has got to behave like um, a small child rushing around, very excitable, very kind of predicated on their own sensations rather than on what is happening in the bigger world. And to me, it just seems that this has run uh, side by side with worsening mental health. So um, I've worked across the spectrum of, of difficulties that people might have, worked with people on the autism spectrum, I've worked in prisons, I've worked in education, I've worked as therapist, and people with brain damage. And the thing that seems to connect so many, if you like, disturbing or unwanted behaviours is a focus on I, myself, me, and my own sensations, my own feelings. And that um, seems to me to be the thing that we are promoting at the moment, and yet there's very little evidence it's doing anything to help. So that is my starting point. Um, and I began with a previous book called The Significance Delusion, trying to go into, if you like, the sort of deep things that made our brains emerge to be so self-important. But Sweet Distress is a kind of follow-up to be slightly more accessible and give people help and advice on how they can counter some of the problems that younger people in particular are facing at the moment. Jenny, Jenny you've given the public's response to the war in Ukraine as a prime example. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's a bit like the response to the NHS, which um, they're both generated a huge amount of emotion, I mean, quite rightly, you might say, um, and a lot of sort of passionate involvement in the early stages. So people seem to want to have their own heightened emotional response to things. But when it comes down to actually sort of doing something practical to improve situations, people will often drift away. They've, they've had the excitement of their own emotional high and then they just sort of lose a bit of interest. So in the case of the NHS, there's all the pot banging and, and that in, in Britain during the uh, lockdown. And yet I know a local hospital where they can't get volunteers to run a coffee shop for patients and their visitors. So, and, and with Ukraine, the idea that young people should be getting so emotionally disturbed by what was going on there, but <laughs> the people in Ukraine were actually having to deal with it um, that seemed to me as something of a mismatch in terms of, you know, how we are coping with things. So do you think it's, a, it's sort of an emotional facade? It's appearance versus reality that we have to display, that it's all fake emotion that you have to throw out there on Twitter or something and you're not actually feeling it inside? Or are people feeling these feelings and you're wondering, well, why are you feeling them? You're not doing anything about it. I think it's probably a, a total mix. I, I think there's an awful um, sort of cultural necessity to show that you've got strong feelings at the moment. You know, everyone has to be passionate about something. To be honest, I'd rather someone was, you know, rather effective at doing a job rather than they were passionate about it. But passion appears to be the defining feature of people's job applications half the time. So I think that there is actually a sort of cultural need or in something imposed on people to show they feel a lot. But there's also a genuine feeling. I mean, I think, you know, especially youngsters, they're at a time when heightened feelings are, you know, prevalent. 
But for people who don't feel things in the same way, and you, you get this a lot with neurodiversity, there's this condition called alexithymia, which is a lack of ability to name feelings, to recognise them for the things that other people would recognise them as being. But I think they're very often bullied into actually displaying or saying that they feel things, which actually they don't really have much knowledge of. So I think it has become a sort of cultural trope, a, a need. Sometimes it's genuine, sometimes it's less genuine. Um, but it's this kind of expectation and demand that we should all be feeling a lot, which I think can artificially ramp up um, excitability and the sort of infantilization, which makes us all um, unable to deal in the more appropriate way, which is better for mental health. I think of my daughter on this. She's five, she's just started school, and she gets asked her how she's feeling and to, to display her emotions and stuff. But I've also noticed in the last while she's suffering when things don't go her way and she gets very upset with it and it's building that resilience. So do you think this has been built and, and taught to children yeah. and to young people and it's the wrong thing to be teaching them? Well, I think, you know, the people saying, oh, you want to take us back to the 1950s or, or, you know, a time when people were emotionally constipated. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there are appropriate emotions for some people to feel under certain circumstances. Not everybody's going to feel the same way. Knowing what you're experiencing is good, but then prioritising that and saying this is the most important thing in the world and everything should sort of bow down to, to my feelings... And I could name people um, high profile in the media at the moment who seem to think that their feelings take precedence over reality. Um, this is not helpful. It doesn't help mental health at all. And the whole focus on I, myself, me, and I explain it all in Sweet Distress, it actually is correlated with worse mental health. There are lots of scientific reasons why focusing on I, myself, me, and my overwhelming sensations actually encourages worse mental health. So those people who say, this is what we must look into, are only getting part of the picture. It's how you investigate those sensations. And I have a saying, which is that feelings are really just physiological sensations mediated by cultural expectations. And in other parts of the world, the same physiological sensation might be interpreted very, very differently. In a less me-focused culture, there is less interpretation of feelings as being about me and my experiences. So they're not um, immutable, these things, at all. But is that... I understand what you're saying, right? We live in a world right here in the developed world um, where, yes, there is a mental health crisis. We know that there is um, the medicization, the, uh, like, m people getting medicated for Depressing mental health is yeah. on the rise. Um, yeah. But, yeah. yes, we are not living under... You know, we're not at the threat of war at the minute, imminently bombs being dropped on our heads. So people do have different responses. Do you think that social media has had an impact on the I am feeling this me, 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 because it is all about that rather than the collective? Yes, I, I think massively so. And the latest figures um, certainly in this country on a young girls' mental health are very disturbing. And as they are more prone to using social media, one can't help but feel that during lockdown, when there was no direct contact with large bodies of people, that focusing in on the self became even more heightened. And it would appear that the outcome is worse mental health for specifically young women. And I, I do really think that we've got to start in schools with parenting, asking children to look beyond themselves, to, to go into a wider world, bigger perspective. And that also applies in education through history, it's not just about your interests in the here and now. We need to get a view as to how we came to become the people I, we are. And Gillian, I would, I would agree. I, I agree with you. But like when you look at even literature from back in the day, Hamlet was all about himself. He was looking at himself. Heathcliff <laughs> was all about himself. Like it, this isn't a new thing. But in Ireland specifically, we have amongst males the fourth highest rate from, um, I think it's sixteen to twenty-five year olds when it comes to suicide. But it's dropping. From like from 2001 to 2016, the rates have dropped because we used to be a country, sweep everything under the carpet, do not speak about mm. it. But now we are encouraging people to speak about it and suicide rates are dropping. So like I do think that we that it's important that we talk about our feelings. 
Well, in fact, for, for women, it's going the other way around. Um, so it's interesting you say Hamlet, because I talk about him in Sweet Distress. We can learn a lot from Shakespeare. Um, it's not a case of not talking about what we're experiencing. And I make that perfectly clear in all my, my works. So it is not this, you should shtum, zip it, say nothing. It's you should understand what's going on. You should know about it. You should have insight into your own sensations. But it's how you talk about it that is significant. So and I don't want to sort of spend a lot of time talking about the science behind it. But essentially, the right side of the brain, which people think of as the sort of creative and expressive one, is a more miserable side of the brain. The left rational side of the brain is more optimistic and positive. And so the more we can rationalise things, um, the more we can avoid things like PTSD. Lots of interesting research in the American military and in Dutch um, police forces and over I mean, generations. It's, yeah. it's, cer it's certainly it's a really interesting topic, Gillian, and I'd say a lot of our viewers will really be wanting to get in touch with this, which we'd love to hear from them, 0896 111 Listen, Gillian, your, your book is out of the minute, Sweet Distress, How Our Love Affair with Feelings Has Fueled the Current Mental Health Crisis and What We Can Do About It. Uh, Gillian Bridge, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Really interesting. Um, now there's lots more Ireland M coming up after the break. Oh, it's time to get the coats out. We're yes. talking switching energy provider. <laughs> Stylist Justine oh. King has her pick of the bunch this morning. Good morning to Justine. Good morning. So we're in that transition from so summer, summer into autumn, it's winter. Freezing but freezing today. It's not that yeah, but I'm not ready for a winter coat, so we're not doing full-blown heavy coats yet. We're seeing what we can wear to just cover up shelter from the rain and still look stylish. Lovely. Okay. Our first look today. Yes, yeah, so first up we have Ursula, and we're starting with the trench coat, which is, of course, a classic every single year, and this is an absolutely beautiful one from Irish brand Friday's Edit. But I'm going to start off with her jewellery, and it's her necklace from Metal and Bloom. This is a new Irish brand first time on Ireland AM. They just launched in May of this year and it's a primary school teacher turned entrepreneur. Oh, um, wow. So this okay. piece is available in gold as well. And it's a really nice versatile piece because it's a choker by day, as you can see with the beautiful little pearls, but you can wear it longer as well to be a longer Did necklace. Did she give up primary school I teaching? Might. I think so. I think this oh, is the new, the new passion okay. project, yeah. Now this trench coat is quite different to what you'd normally think of a trench coat. Yes, it's a beautiful caped trench yeah. coat. Absolutely stunning. You can't see it now, but oh, it's look almost at that. sleeveless. Yeah, the yeah. And then it also has those beautiful sleeves on it too. It's got the big tie waist, the big pockets. It also comes in a sage green, which is quite interesting as well from Friday's edit. But that's a gorgeous one to wear over a dress as I've styled it. But I think with your jeans and a t-shirt, it looks really chic. They're very year cool. Year Open us all. Oh, look at her shoot a tease for us as she turns <laughs> around. There she goes. So the dress again is from Friday's edit. So they're an Irish brand who are online. Beautiful shirt dress, button down. I love that tiered effect as well. That's really flattering. It comes in a small up to a large. It has its own tie waist. Um, but you could add your own little belt onto that too. And yeah. it does come in a mini version, um, if you'd prefer that rather than... That trench looks that. really light. Is it really light? Super light. So yeah. it's a really nice one for now. And again, coming into spring, mm. um, it's a really good one. So the, the boots, boots then, they're from Murphy Shoes. And I love that style of the kind of desert boot worn with the dress. Big chunky boot. They also have that in tan suede and in black leather. Um, and that is 100% suede. And it's Nero Giardini, a gorgeous Italian brand. She looks like she's heading up the McGillicuddy Reeks there with the boots. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure, Ursula. Well, Thank you boots. so much. Now, Danielle, is coming out. We're going to start with the coat on this one on Danny. Yes, it's stunning, isn't it? This one is from Irish brand Balut Clothing. This is a coat again, so it's not as heavy as a full-blown coat. Great one for an occasion wear piece. You could wear it as your everyday coat. It does come as well in a camel, a navy and a khaki. And I love that wrap style because you can wear it right off the shoulder as well. I'm and they're really about. nice when they're open, like yeah. with jeans. They're just very handy. Versatile, easy kind of pieces. And that is also free size. That is going to fit anyone from an eight probably up to about a 14 in that coat too. You have, an, you have a neck piece here as well. Yes, a beautiful neck piece. Again, this is from Metal and Bloom and this one is all about colour. This is the Aura Chakra necklace. So it's made up of seven chakras and they say that wearing a chakra necklace brings unlimited joy and wealth by attracting positive energy. Danny, so, do you have unlimited oh, joy right now? Right. Look at her. Look at that okay. smile. Right. Unlimited the cost we, all, we all need something necklace. that's going oh, to bring us on, unlimited joy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, it's also absolutely <laughs> stunning apart from that and obviously with all the different colours going through it you could wear it with 
anything in your wardrobe. Uh, so kind of a bat wing coat, a sleeve. Well, the ring oh, then again is from Metal and Bloom. And again, that one's all about color. It's the Adorn ring. So it's kind of abstract laid stones and rectangular stones all in kind of contrasting colors. Is again. there a bat wing sleeve on the jumper? Yeah, so this is a kind of a boat neck jumper, I'd call oh. it, with a bat wing sleeve. Oh yeah, gotcha. And it's a beautiful, super soft knit. Um, it's also from Balut clothing. And that one comes in navy, turquoise and white. So that's a great one with your jeans as well. But I love it tucked into this midi skirt. So this skirt, the gorgeous paisley print. It's got a little side slit as well. Really comfortable to wear. It's got an elasticated waist as well. Um, and I think that's a kind of a dress it up or dress it down skirt. I like that it has the black going through it as well. So yeah. you can bring the black into the boots then. And, and the little boots are back again. Yes. These are just, if you don't already have sock boots in your wardrobe, they are a staple year after year. I love them with a straight jean. You can also wear them with a skinny jean tucked in, wear them with your dresses, your tights. They literally go with everything. Lovely, Danny. Thank you so much. You and your chakras were lovely Thanks, today. Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Kerry is yeah. here. Kerry is here in a lovely casual look today from Chic Boutique in Scaries. Will I start off with the necklace? Yeah, work, work yeah, away. Yeah, so the necklace, again, from Metal and Bloom. This is the antithesis choker. So it's the tiny little small pearls. And then it has that beautiful T-bar flower clasp on it too. So this is a clasp, I think, that's designed to be worn. That's kind very of, cute. It's stunning, isn't it? And it's kind of a pearl necklace with a point of difference because it is that choker too. The earrings then, what I love about these is they're the gorgeous little gold huggies with the diamante detailing. But the pearl you can either wear or you can remove it so they can be worn as a really simple huggy or with that little point of difference to dress them up a little bit. Lovely. Now, the jacket. So yes. this is, I mean, leather jacket. Yes. So this is from Chic Boutique and Scaries. They're in Scaries and also online. This one has stretch side panels, which we love. So it's a really comfortable one to wear. I love that waterfall effect at the front. It's not as heavy as kind of a biker and it's a very flattering front to a jacket. They also have this in green and in black and it's available in an eight. Is that a 16. different material on the collar? Yeah. So again, that's that kind of stretch fabric on the collar. So it's oh, kind of a okay. contrast with the collar. And this one, just throw it on over absolutely anything. But they've got the little stretch panel on the sleeve too. So it just, it really moves with you. It's not a stiff And a casual jacket. top with an unusual bottom to it. Is that elasticated, the bottom of the top? Uh, don't think it's elasticated. It's just kind of a nice relaxed fit on the top. Again, we've got a contrasting sleeve. So it's a super light knit on the sleeve and then the gorgeous satin front. And then it's got the beautiful print going through it. Now this is free size. So this is going to fit kind of an eight up to a 14, that top too. And it comes in a range of colors at Chic Boutique. The jeans then, these the are- The bling on the jeans. Yes, they've got the embellishment at the bottom. These are a really a bestseller for Chic Boutique because they've got the little bit of lace too. They're a great fit. They're high-waisted and they're super stretch. Gorgeous with a tan boot as well. I've just Very added sure. a trainer yeah. just to show you how to wear them for daytime. And they are a gorgeous bronze trainer from Nero Giardini, again, with the little bit of gold detail and they're from Murphy Shoes. Lovely, cool. thank you so much, Kerry. And Ursula's coming Ursula's back with back. My, one of my favorite coats. She's got a blazer on. Yes, the blazer, the staple in every Irish woman's wardrobe. Where would we be without them? But I love that they're so versatile. We yeah. can wear them, work wear, casual wear, you know, uh, dress them up for a night out. And this one is, again, from Chic Boutique in Scaries. Um, I love the cobalt blue. It's a little bit different from just wearing your black blazer. Cami top underneath that and a pair of jeans, dress it up for a night out, you know. Yeah, yeah. navy with... jeans, black jeans, you're good to go. Absolutely. Yeah, the dress and it's is a real a really statement, nice fit. This dress is a statement, so we're picking up on the cobalt in that. That dress also comes in a kind of a coral mix. It's a really easy dress to wear. You could team that with trainers, with long boots, with ankle boots. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just kind of does all the talking because it's so it's statement. It's really fab. A little necklace with that the, uh, to catch the eye. Yes, the, the necklace is the identity necklace. So it's got a little initial in the middle of a halo-like frame with all of the beautiful different colors of the rainbow gone, going on. It's available in all of the initials, of course, of the alphabet. And I just think it's a little bit different. We see a lot of initial necklaces, but this one is so striking and such a little statement piece with the little halo around oh, it. And the ring is gorgeous with it. Yeah. It's really packed, picks yeah. up all the colors. Yes, exactly. So we're really all about color in this look. And that ring is the chroma ring. So it's got an array of the bright contrasting gemstones going through it too. And then the little blue. boots. Yes, yeah, so these are absolutely stunning boots from Murphy's Shoes. They've got the little leather toe and then the leather heel, and then they're super soft to the touch. And they are great ones for wearing with bare legs too. Those sock boots, as I mentioned earlier, wear them with your straight jeans as well going over them too. How high are your boots today? Right up. You've gone right up. <laughs> I love it. They're back. I'm delighted. Oh, yeah. Just I'm delighted. Thank you so much. Some lovely looks this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Now stick around. We're finding out uh, about breast milk bracelets and semen sculptures. Good morning. You're with Ireland AM. <laughs> oh, Justine doesn't have to do it. Now our next guest has gone viral for her unique business making custom jewellery using 
bodily fluids. Indeed, Canadian artist Amanda Booth joins us from Ontario now. Good morning, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us. Morning, and guys. we've been chatting about it and we've been having a great old laugh. <laughs> Jizzy Jewelry, Amanda, where did this idea come from? What happened? So originally I was doing simply breast milk and memorial pieces with ashes. Um, and then on one of my TikToks where I was doing a breast milk piece, somebody had put a joking, like a, a joking comment up asking if I'd ever incorporated um, semen into a piece before. Um, and at first I was like offended by it <laughs> because it's not something that you'd really think of, um, especially with the sentimental pieces that I work with. Um, but one day me and the team were joking um, and I ended up deciding to post that joke on Facebook um, about jizzy jewelry and um, how it could be a thing. And uh, people actually took it seriously. So I got serious requests and orders from it. Um, and that's kind of how it all started. <laughs> Tell, like, jizzy jewelry. Like, how mm -hmm. does it work? There we and go. And what do you make? <laughs> so... Because I'm a clay artist, I can basically make anything, right? So um, I can sculpt whether it's simple pieces. Actually, I have my Jizzy jewelry on. <laughs> so I can do like simple pearls. Um, I can do more complicated things like this piece, which is more, um, has weaved wire wrapping. Um, I even have sculpture orders um, that are coming in where I have more detailed large pieces. Um, but basically people send me their sample. Um, I have a special concoction that I mix it with. And then we kind of spread it. <laughs> spread it like peanut butter on parchment paper to let dry overnight and then grind it, grind it into a fine powder and that powder goes into the clay. So we're looking at this process right now. Amanda, yeah, that... people have to send you samples, right? Yes. This is, you know, Yeah, like... no, I, we don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, who has to deal with that, Amanda? Do you have to deal with that? That's got to smell a bit funky. <laughs> the staff, bringing that one up to the staff must be an interesting <laughs> one. Right? Well, it was my creative assistants that really um, uh, pushed for the joke, like for me to put it up on Facebook. Um, my shipper receiver flat out refuses. He will not deal with any of the samples that come in. Um, so it's all left to my husband, who's my business partner. Um, he's the one who processes all of it. Um, well, until I get it you know, as a powder. As a powder. So he does all of that up until the powder is You're... there a smell uh i mean it's it, it smells like semen um just a lot more pungent <laughs> because it's been in the mail for so long <laughs> oh my can you imagine the post the post people haven't a clue like they don't know what the, they're just like people are sending it through the post you said you're wearing some right now yeah, I have. Um, this is from the test batch because obviously I, once people ordered, I had to make sure that I knew how to do it and that it would actually work. Um, so my husband gave me a sample um, to to test out. So I have, I made earrings, um, a small pearl necklace. I have, well, I made a whole bunch of pieces and then of course my ring and we have bracelets as well. The pearl necklace. Fair play to um, them. How much would say a pearl necklace cost? Um, so I'm, I, I didn't figure out the conversion to euros, but for um, a small pearl necklace like this one, um, I charge 110 Canadian and it's free um, international shipping actually. Um, and then for a full pearl necklace, it's 170 Canadian. So, cause I, w I was on your website and it does, you know, you ship to Ireland. Mm. I could say I was, of course I was yeah. on the website because you do loads of things, but this has obviously sparked people's imagination. For you, it was a joke that you put up. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you yep. can't buy the marketing that this has that this has brought you. So when people are laughing, like who is honestly ordering this? Honestly, there's a huge for, uh, variety of reasons. Um, some people, it's in the BDSM community, so it's like a sub-dom relationship um, and why they want the piece. Uh, I have some women who are getting them as vasectomy presents for their husbands um, for <laughs> before they, they go for their vasectomy. <laughs> Um, I also have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, those women have a great <laughs> sense of humour. Right? Amazing. Um, and then 
And then I also have um, uh, people who have gone through um, uh, a hard time uh, getting pregnant. So uh, they get it to symbolize their uh, fertility journey as well. Um, And then, of course, there's people who just get them as jokes because it's like an inside secret between them and their partner when they're wearing their jewelry Or to somebody you really don't like as a nice Christmas present. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I mentioned it to my wife about the breast milk part, not the jizzy Mm jewelry. And she thought it was a lovely idea, like breast milk, you know, it might be some so like how much not that uh, not that maybe we might be getting it but how, like how big a sample do you need for like doing like how much you know whenever you're talking like a jizzy jewelry bit how does that work, how does that work? i honestly never thought i'd be sitting beside tommy asking <laughs> biggest sequence i'm needed to give for a christmas present okay sorry. find out for it. <laughs> Um, so for sample size, I normally ask for one to two teaspoons. Um, but obviously the bigger the sample, the easier it is just in case anything happens. So Amanda, you're some woman. I swear to God, (laughs) it's unbelievable. (laughs) You you have, you have your, you know, your jewelry business as well. It's all there trinkets by Amanda Booth. And you have been working in this area for a very long, like you do stuff for pets and people who have been like cremated and everything. (laughs) Yeah, actually, like my business didn't start that long ago. I actually only started it last year. Um, I only got into clay work and sculpting last year as kind of like a therapy for myself. And my friends and followers on Facebook kept custom ordering things. And that's honestly like the entire business has been a happy accident. Um, I didn't get into memorial pieces until um, I had a friend who tragically lost their son and asked me to incorporate his ashes into memorial jewelry for her. Um, So that was just by happenstance. And then uh, another friend was like, well, if you did it with ashes, you could do it with breast milk. And so I was like, yeah, I can try. So I did a bunch of research. And every request that comes in, because I do everything custom, so people can literally message me and ask for absolutely anything. If I've never done it before, I'll figure out, like, I'll find a way. Amanda, you really... Like, honestly, you are game for a laugh. You do really nice memorial pieces as well. It's Trinkets by Amanda Booth. You can find it online. She ships to Ireland. Amanda, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you Thank so you, much. Amanda. Thank you guys so much for having me. Alan. <laughs> Fair play, sir. Alan. Overdue. <laughs> <laughs> On tomorrow's show, we find out. We're, yeah, Mary Byrne and Jay Carter is joining us. Uh, plus two-time Donegal All-Star turn manager and pundit Mark McHugh. And I'm on the Limerick Greenway. Yes, I'll be uh, visiting medieval castles and meerkats on me head. You don't want to miss it. We'll, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.